This is an island synonymous with curling. All over the world, the raw material from Ailsa Craig is used for curling stones. The stones are made of microgranite, Ailsa Craig common green for the body, and the Ailsa Craig blue hone granite for the running surface on the ice. This is the common green granite. It's identifiable with its greenish colour, plus the little black flecks that are in it. So this, um, from Kay's point of view, is the body of the curling stone. This makes the body of the curling stone. Um, it's very good, it's impact resistant, uh, it looks springy. So the, the players always say that the stones spring very well when they're in the house. And that's important for them when they're having to make the big shot. When we go to the blue hone granite, which is this one, it's a kind of slaty grey colour, maybe even a little blue, and it has little white flecks in it called feldspars. And, and they are just, if you like, uh, uh, white granite, but it's still part of the, the blue hone granite. And this granite, to all intents and purposes, is a micro granite, and therefore really is effectively waterproof, which makes it ideal for sitting on the ice because it's not going to have any water ingress. Well, today's curling stone has gone through various modifications over the last 200 years or so, one thing has been consistent over that time the use of the material from Ailsa Craig and some similar rock from Wales called Trevor. There is evidence which shows that granite for 200 stones was exported from Ailsa Craig to Canada in 1829. Previous to the Ailsa Craig discovery, all sorts of materials and rocks were tried. In the 1700s, they were dragged out of riverbeds where they'd been shaped and smoothed by the action of the water and adapted for curling on ponds and lochs. They were all shapes and sizes and weights. Then later, some stones were fashioned from local quarries. Handles were attached. They might have looked the part, but didn't last. They were brittle and inconsistent on different ice surfaces, and running bands were too easily damaged. So keen curlers were always on the lookout for something better. Uh, way back in those days, there were three or four other sources of, of raw material on the mainland in Scotland that, that would be used quite widely. And there was uh, Crawford John and Carsfairn and Burnett Water. None of them really compared favourably at all with the Ailsa Craig material. So eventually it was, it was all Ailsa Craig. Can put a nice bias on your stone by a twist of the wrist. Over time, the Ailsa granite showed they could stand up to the hits during games without damage and were the first choice of curlers. By the 1860s, the Gurfin family had seized the opportunity and leased the small Scottish island from the Marquis of Ailsa. They lived there right up until the early 1950s, producing rough hewing blocks ready to be made into curling stones by the various manufacturers. What we see in the rocks from Alpha Craig and Trevor are that they have quartz. They have, in fact, 15 to 25 percent quartz, which is quite quite a lot of quartz. Um, and that suggests that quartz is maybe not the problem in curling stone. And in fact, if we look at sort of both sides of the striking band and the running running band, the striking band um, is related to impact, right? So collision. It suggested that the I guess the character of the quartz, so how strained it is, is plays an important role in that. And also in the running surface or the running band, um, again, it's that quartz that is very mechanically resistant to wear, and so it makes it less um, likely to basically uh, break up on a small scale. Granites are usually coarse grains, so they have large grain sizes. And the reason why they have large grain sizes is because they had a bit more time to cool, and so those crystals had more time to form. Molten rock that sort of forms at a higher level, so like closer to the surface, sort of like alpha craze, then what happens is that it cools a bit faster. And then even though the composition is very similar, right, it's still sort of this granitic composition, um, the grain size tends to be a bit smaller, sort of like the rocks in alpha craze just something about the way it crystallized and the and the grain the weather grains held together to give it its its useful mechanical properties 
the thing about the Elsa Craig granite is it's, it's not only tough, but it's also um, very resilient and uh, it seems to, it kind of bounces, you know, if you hit two pieces together, it's sort of because it's so tough, it, um, it has enough, enough sort of very micro scale giving it to, uh, to, to, to be just elastic enough for, for stones to bounce off each other rather than just go plonk. There's a practical side to this too. While transportation of the Ailsa Craig rock has never been straightforward, the way the cliffs are structured on the island, almost in columns, makes quarrying easier, even in the old days. As more indoor curling rinks were established, rules and regulations came in and progression towards the 21st century stone continued. A significant development was the use of blue hone and common green granite or Welsh trefor in the one stone. The first time I saw the, the two types of stone was in Canada. That happened in the very early 70s. They were actually done in Scotland. They were done in, in Glasgow in, in Scotland by the, the other company that was still in existence at that time, Scottish Curling Stone Company. They had pioneered the, the, the ale cert. The common ales uh, was a coarser grain um, of material. It meant it wasn't as hard wearing, but it was better for absorbing the, the, the knocks and the bumps that the stone gets round on the, on the striking band round the outside circumference of the stone. The common eels was better for that because the blue hone, um, the part that was used for the bottom of the stone and, and the running surface on the ice, it was much harder wearing and resistant to absorbing moisture than the common eels are. Um, so we had the best of both worlds then. There's nothing else being found yet. They've tested various other uh, substances and what have you, but none has had the performance and the longevity uh, that the Blue Hone has. I also know that for the running band, they um, have tried to use ceramic instead of using Altecray's Blue Hone. And apparently, um, based on what I've heard, the problem with that is that the ceramics don't actually keep the curl. So you can texture them, but over a quick period of time to actually lose the curl. And that probably relates back to this idea of intergrown, um, I guess, minerals within this, this uh, material. Believe it or not, in Holland and the Netherlands um, did make synthetic stones and supplied us with, um, with a supply of, of that material. And we, we did make some stones out of it. Um, but they were just weren't successful at all. They, they didn't come up to expectation at all. Ultimately, we have to go back to the science and see and do a bit more research in, in terms of what is important in a rock and what's not. I mean, again, ultimately these rocks are natural, right? So they're going to have differences. I, but I think as it is, I mean, if, if it works, don't fix it, right? This craggy ocean pyramid, as famous British poet John Keats described it in 1818, is geologically unique. Its microgranite has been used for the world's curling stones for nearly two centuries. Proof, if it were needed, of its resilience, durability, consistency, its finish, its performance, and of course, its story, steeped in history and tradition.